panel of our last day of the TPAC 2021 conference. And I'm really excited to get to moderate this one on resisting institutional violence. We're going to have four different presentations. So I'll read uh, the paper titles or the presentation titles along with a quick sketch biography of each panelist um, in order. And then I will turn it over to, I believe Anthony and Lee are going to get us started. So I'll read through those quickly so we know who everyone is. Um, and a brief reminder for panelists to note that you should add your pronouns to your display name. And if you need help with that, feel free to use the chat function to ask and you can ask French, English, fine. We have somebody in each language to figure that out. Um, and thanks so much to everybody for joining us and thanks for uh, your presentations panelists. And I'll go ahead and let everybody know here. So first up, we will have uh, a presentation called the Trans Doe Task Force and Postmortem Harm Reduction, Caring for Unidentified Transgender, Non-Binary and Intersex Decedents. And that'll be from Anthony and Lee Redgrave, uh, both based out of Redgrave Research and the Trans Doe Task Force uh, in the USA. And then we'll be hearing from Kiannan Russell, who is based in Belgium and affiliated with ILGA Europe, I-L-G-A Europe, uh, and we'll be presenting on help seeking behaviors and barriers among trans and gender diverse survivors of sexual violence. Then third, we'll get to hear from Candance uh, Veronica Chavez Lopez, uh, or Candy, uh, from Red Lac Trans, that is Red Latinoamericana y del Caribe de Personas Trans in Argentina, on trans activism in Mexico, legal gender recognition and documenting violences. And then last, we will hear from Kai Davidson, who is affiliated with Lehigh University in their Department of Psychology, here in the United States of America. And their presentation is called Exploring Non-Binary Individuals Experiences with Incarceration. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Transdo Task Force to hear from Anthony and Lee. Thanks so much for getting us started. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share our screen and hopefully do it right. So bear with me. Um, you do screen one and then present, come on, you see, all right, is that the right screen showing for everybody? Yep, that's perfect. Sure. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Um, one second, okay, there we go. All right, so thank you for coming to our presentation entitled Trans Doe Task Force and Postmortem Harm Reduction, Caring for Unidentified Transgender, Non-Binary and Intersex Decedents. I'm Anthony Redgrave, and this is my partner in everything, Lee Bingham Redgrave. And my clicker is working, I swear. Okay, so before we get started, we want to include a content warning. We'll be discussing fatal violence against transgender people. Um, however, there'll be no images of violence or human remains shown in this presentation. Um, so uh, more about us, we've been married and uh, partners for 15 years, both in, in life and genealogical research. Um, we're both trans and use he, him pronouns. I also use they, them. We live in central Massachusetts in the USA. Uh, with our 18 year old daughter who is also trans. I was adopted when I was an infant and that's where my interest in genealogy came from and Anthony didn't know who his father was and so that's why we learned about DNA and how to solve our own mysteries and then we started helping other adoptees and then eventually got into forensic cases um, in 2018. And so we were on some of the first cases that were solved with forensic genetic genealogy. We were with the DNA Doe Project initially, and then we left a little over a year ago to form our own company, Redgrave Research Forensic Services, and to expand our training program that we run, as well as our passion project, which is the Trans Doe Task Force. And as you can see here in this picture, we're operating all these projects out of one office right now. So 
I'm also, um, I'm a doctoral student at the University of New England, and I have a master's degree in instructional design and technology that I applied to the training course that we run. Um, so a little about my uh, proposed doctoral dissertation study is it's on the topic of developing standards of practice and educational foundations for forensic genetic genealogy in cases of fatal violence towards minority and marginalized persons. And I'll be conducting a narrative survey of four determined stakeholder groups, four groups that I've determined have some uh, something to, to gain or be concerned about in the use of forensic genetic genealogy, forensic gen genetic genealogists themselves, criminal justice professionals, DNA test consumers, and family members of victims, missing persons, and perpetrators of violent crimes. And that does also include wrongfully, wrongfully incarcerated people as well, um, anyone who has been uh, involved in the legal system. If you'd like to volunteer for this study, you can email me at aredgrave at une.edu and I will get back to you as soon as it's approved by the IRB. I'm specifically looking for people who are involved in these groups that are also members of minority or marginalized populations. I'm also looking for non-minority participants as well so I can compare the data. So if you're interested, please send me an email and tell your friends. So uh, what we do with the Transdo Task Force specifically is uh, that we find and research cases of LGBTQ missing and murdered persons uh, with special focus oh, Oops. with special focus on um, cases where the victims were uh, were or may have been transgender. Uh, we advise and educate the public, media, and forensic professionals about the needs of and differences between Transdo cases and other Doe cases. And we also assist law enforcement departments, medical examiners, and forensic anthropologists with, get, with getting their cases worked on by forensic genetic genealogists. Um, so right now we are, like I said, operating under one umbrella. We're in the process of separating out Transdo Task Force and writing articles of incorporation and um, naming board members. So if you're interested in that, please let us know. So a little more about what we do. Um, more specifically, we give a bit of an overview. Of this is what we actually do. So uh, we identify harmful st systemic problems that affect cases of LGBTQ plus involved fatal violence, propose both immediate and long-term solutions focused on harm reduction. Harm reduction is also applicable to decedents as well as the living, and that's the main focus of our work. We find and research relevant cases, cases in which there are contextual clues of an individual being a member of the LGBTQ community. And we enter and compare those cases in our own custom database that we'll be talking about a little bit later. We reach out to law enforcement agencies and medical examiners and other criminal justice professionals to offer practical support and solutions for cold cases that uh, involve LGBTQ plus people and we prepare and present educational materials to law enforcement and forensic science professionals and students about the unique needs of TETF cases. So if you're an educator and you'd like us to come speak to, our, to your class, send us an email, we do that all the time. And we also identify cases in which DNA evidence is available uh, and work to get those cases submitted to the appropriate laws for DNA extraction and sequencing and we provide genealogical analysis on DNA profiles with an all LGBTQ plus informed ally genealogy team. Um, so epidemic levels of hate-based violence, this is the reason why we do what we do. And this is really the crux of it. Approximately three out of four transgender decedents are misgendered in initial police media or media reports surrounding their death. Um, and it's more than just that, but that's the obvious forward-facing fact, and we've all seen it. Some uh, statistics here that will uh, inform more exactly why this is important. One in two two hundred six thousand transgender. Sorry, <laughs> one one in two thousand six hundred transgender homicide victims in two thousand sixteen were black transgender women. One in 19,000 is the average homicide rate of the general population of the United States in 2016. Both these statistics are from 2016. So one in 19,000 people were murdered in 2016 and 
one in 2,600 people, 2,600 trans people were black transgender women. So it is 7.3 times more likely for a black transgender woman to be murdered than the average homicide rate. So these issues are intersectional. There are, uh, if you're in more than one, uh, uh, un, uh, what's the minority category, you're, you're more likely to unfortunately be the victim of homicide. Um, We've got a request from interpreters for you to slow down a bit, if that's okay. Oh, oh, sorry, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so on this, on this slide, we're talking about what is a forensically significant population. Forensically significant means that we're talking about a population that should be considered a minority group that are not outliers. Unfortunately, most of us have been considered outliers for a very long time and it's time to take charge and recognize that we are an actual population forensically. Um, on the topic of specifically people who are sexually indeterminate or intersex at birth, as many as 2% of live human births would be considered sexually indeterminate based on the current standards of sexual dimorphism. And there's over 6, 6,500,000 estimated number of people in the United States who may be intersex based on the current estimated population of the US. That's 2% of the population. That's no, that's no small number. And the estimated number of victims of homicide per year, assuming the same rate as, of homicide as the average population would be 8,638. But considering the heightened risk of fatal violence towards people who are considered gender diverse, the actual rate may be much higher. So flaws in the uh, forensic identification process. This is where the current forensic identification process does not serve trans or gender variant people. Um, do you want to take this slide? Um, sure. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so basically we're looking at these statistics and you should see these things reflected in, in the databases. And unfortunately, when you look in the databases of identified decedents, that that isn't reflected. So um, we're trying to figure out what's the problem here. And uh, the problem is that there's a lack of standards of practice in reporting cases. Uh, so the people who are, who are actually writing down the information and transmitting it um, need to be re-educated on how to do this appropriately so that it can serve our population. I'm going to try to skip through a little bit of this because yeah. we're running short on time. So yeah. you can go back to these slides. We've uploaded mm -hmm. them um, into our profile. So this is a case example of what we're talking about. This is Julie Doe. She's still unidentified. She's, uh, her case is in active research with genealogy at the DNA Doe Project. And the Transgender Task Force did refer this case to the DDP. Um, she was found partially mummified body in Florida in 1988. And initially the anthropological estimate said that she was a Jane Doe. And so they entered her into the NamUs system, which is the national, um, the, the most, go the most uh, frequently visited national unidentified persons database. And so she was Jane Doe from 1988 to 2014 until investigators pulled a DNA profile on her and found XY chromosomes and said, oh, wait a minute, we have to make this person a John Doe now because we were wrong. Um, but she was found wearing, you know, a mini skirt and pantyhose. So where does this person need to be in the database so that we can find any missing person who might match this unidentified decedent. Um, and the answer is, is that there isn't a really good answer because people don't use the unknown box. People will pick one or the other. They'll pick a binary gender to assign to a decedent. There wasn't even an unknown box until about two years ago. Right, until we pointed out this problem, that this was just totally unnoticed. So, um, if somebody was missing a son and had entered this, this person as a missing person, um, that wouldn't have been compared to a Jane Doe until it, you know from 88 to 2014. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if somebody say had reported their loved one 
who was a trans woman missing as a missing female, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been somebody who would be compared to Julie in the system presently if she's entered in as a John Doe. So this is, it's just very incongruous with what uh, the needs of our cases in our, in our population actually are. Mm -hmm. And you have about three and a half <laughs> minutes left. Um, and just another okay. reminder to, to slow up just a little bit more, if that's okay. You're doing great. In this okay, we'll try. <laughs> Appreciate it. There's a, a lot of info jam packed in here, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so harm reduction strategies for prof forensic professionals. We have this solution. We have made our own database to solve this problem. It is called the LAMP database, the LGBTQ plus accountability for missing and murdered persons. We've basically eliminated the problem of uh, not being able com to compare across sex categories. And we've, entered, we've added fields for genealogical information in preparation for forensic genealogy. Um, you can email us with more questions about this and take a look at the website. So what are we asking of professionals? Um, specifically of anthropologists, anthropologists have been huge allies to us in our efforts. And we've been encouraging the use of gender neutral language in forensic reports. Uh, to separate sex estimation from gender and to not assume that sex equals gender and to include definitions of possibly gender diverse uh, words in reports much like they do with terms like anti-mortem, perimortem, and post-mortem and to also encourage uh, gender diverse anthropologists and anthropology students to take the lead on research. And similarly, what we ask of law enforcement um, is to adjust their language that they're using in reports and to consult with us before going to the media and um, make sure that they're doing everything respectfully. And same with genealogists. Uh, if you're a genealogist and you're entering a trans person in your tree, do so respectfully. And we have uh, basically put forward standards of, uh, standards of best practice and uh, harm reduction based Mm -hmm. ideas for these three people, th these three categories of people. Yeah. This is uh, something that we are very excited to announce is that we have a dedicated team of LGBTQ plus and allied genealogists to work on these cases because we have the skills to take care of our own cases. And it's up to us to make sure that our narratives are not rewritten or erased. That's why we're having this conference this weekend. And we have to prioritize our own cases because historically they've been repeatedly deprioritized as high risk lifestyles and not given appropriate attention. And what are some ways that you can help? So um, if you're in a professional field that has anything to do with human identification or talking about trans bodies, you can consider ways in which you can dismantle ineffective or harmful human identification practices. You can encourage others to learn about us. You can share our flyers. We have a flyer you can print out on our website and you can submit cases to the database. Also upload your DNA to GEDmatch if you've taken a direct -to consumer DNA test. If you have questions or you have concerns about this, please contact us for assistance. Um, this is all of our contact information. This is in the slide deck that you can download. And um, any of these multiple hats, I know we have multiple emails to go to the different hats, but it's all um, us. It's all us. <laughs> and if you email the wrong one, don't worry, we'll get it anyway. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's our presentation. These are our references that we used in this presentation. And please contact us if you have any questions and we'll be sticking around for the Q&A as well. Thank you so much, Lee and Anthony. It was a fantastic presentation and I'm gonna make sure to take time to look at those slides after this as well to see some of the stuff we, we didn't have time for. Um, something that I forgot to ask in our setup of panelists is whether or not you're comfortable with uh, your presentations being shared, one, live on social media via Twitter, um, and two, a recording of this panel later on YouTube um, and you don't need to answer out loud right now. Um, you can chat me if you're uncomfortable and we can let people know not to tweet. Yeah, um, that's totally fine. I don't mind at all. Okay. Answer Perfect. Perfect. In the chat. <laughs> um, and then I'll just, as we turn it over to each successive panelist, I'll remind you when you start to notify everybody in attendance as to whether or not you're comfortable with that being shared. Um, Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, and we'll move on now to Kian and Russell.
uh, whenever you're ready, you can take it away and let us know. Uh, I see in the chat, you said you're comfortable with anything being shared on whatever platform, which is fantastic. Yes, I'm perfectly fine with things being shared. I am going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Can you see uh, this slide that says Barry to care for trans and non-binary gender diverse people? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, thanks very much everyone for tuning in to this conversation. Um, I, uh, well, my uh, identity on the um, platform says that I'm with ILGA Europe. That is my day job and this is actually a side project. Uh, so I'm here today presenting on behalf of the Trans Survivors Network. We are an international uh, survivor-led organization doing uh, sexual violence uh, and rape uh, research uh, and uh, advocacy work uh, specifically focused on trans, uh, gender diverse and non-binary survivors of sexual violence. Um, so before I jump into the presentation today, following on the previous presenter, I also need to present a trigger warning. Um, the presentation does focus on experiences of trans, non-binary, and gender diverse people with sexual violence uh, and help seeking after incidents of sexual violence. There are no descriptions of specific incidents. There are no images, uh, and there are no identifying information or, or anything like that in this in this presentation. But if you think that the topic might be difficult, this would be a, a good moment to go grab a coffee or, or take a take a restroom break. Um, yes. So. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some research that we have conducted, but before doing that, I think it's important to kind of lay the groundwork on uh, what we know about uh, sexual violence and, and transgender diverse and non-binary people. Um, and there's not a great deal of information, and there's certainly not a great deal that's detailed, but what we do have are a series of studies uh, across different largely uh, English speaking uh, and global north uh, regions looking at the prevalence of sexual violence in our communities. Uh, and the, all of them find higher than uh, either cisgender men or cisgender women's exposure to sexual violence uh, in their contexts. Um, and in most cases, the, the numbers average around half. Um, the U.S. Trans Survey from 2015 uh, found 47% of, uh, of respondents had experienced sexual violence, which jumped to almost 60% when looking specifically at non-binary people assigned female at birth. Uh, the Australian Trans Pathways study, which looked at youth, uh, found that uh, around 30% were survivors of either violence from within or without of the family. Uh, and this was uh, everyone who was a respondent there was under 25. Uh, similarly, an Australian uh, larger study uh, found that around half, 53, 54% uh, of people were, were survivors of sexual violence. Uh, and then the New Zealand study from 2019, counting ourselves, found 47% uh, of all respondents were survivors of sexual violence, and again, 55% of non-binary people. Uh, so the, the statistics are pretty harrowing. Uh, that, that kind of averages out to around one in two. Uh, trans people. And so what our study sought to do uh, was to look at what happened after trans people were exposed to sexual violence and their, uh, ex their processes in seeking help and then how effective uh, their help seeking was. So what we did uh, was the, the Board of Trans Survivors Network developed a survey. Uh, the survey was conducted entirely online. Uh, it was a sort of quantitative plus methodology. So most questions were either multiple choice or multiple mark, uh, followed by an open text uh, opportunity to explain or give additional information. Um, we uh, conducted the survey in 11 languages. Uh, that was English, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, Vietnamese, Swahili. Um, I always get stuck partway through. Uh, Polish uh, and, and two more that are going to come to me while we're... Uh, Bahasa Indonesian and something else. I'm sorry for whatever that 11th language was. Um, we used uh, entirely trans translators uh, for the process of tra translating. Uh, all of them were paid. Uh, and there was um, a, a very active sort of 
translation process to ensure that uh, the way that text was translated would be accessible for the potential respondents uh, and that Hindi, Hindi was number 11, uh, that, uh, that it would be um, in, in the kinds of language that uh, trans people who speak that language primarily use to describe themselves and the kinds of help that they might seek. Um, we used uh, social media-based dissemination as well as reaching out to trans organizations uh, that worked in or worked with communities who use all 11 of the languages, uh, which meant hundreds of emails uh, to trans organizations asking them to share the survey. Um, and uh, then additionally asked people to um, uh, either uh, through uh, support groups that we know or uh, through direct uh, contacts that we had with other individuals. Um, and then as a, as a way to protect participants, we created a, an independent email account where people could contact us if they needed support going through the survey. And we also offered uh, the board members to uh, take the survey with people or to take it for them while reading the questions to them so that they could answer them to us and then we would fill it in. Uh, so we tried to provide a variety of, of uh, resources that made it a bit more accessible for folks. Um, and uh, on the, the quantitative um, structure of, this, of the survey, our main intention was to make it possible for people to respond without feeling like they needed to um, carry a, a really significant uh, psychological load. Uh, and so we designed it in a way that really tried to make it as low load as possible with, while still sort of seeking specific information about help seeking behaviors. Uh, the survey was open from June of last year until this April, um, and this is our this was our flyer. Uh, in case you saw it around social media, um, the we ended up receiving a little over 200 re completed responses, and about 150 more that started and got far enough that uh, they showed up in the survey system, but not far enough to count as a completed response. Um, from those, we had almost 70 were assigned female at birth, 28% uh, were assigned male at birth, uh, and then 1% uh, said they were assigned something else. Um, among gender identities, 38% uh, identified as non-binary, 43% as trans men, 22% as trans women. Um, and then we also had a, a checkbox question where people could identify themselves as belonging to uh, another marginalized group, uh, and almost two-thirds of respondents were LGB, 5% uh, were intersex, uh, 19 indigenous, 14% uh, were sex workers, 13% uh, identified as BIPOC, um, and 14% with a disability. So what we did with the survey first was ask about, uh, what, first, whether people had been exposed to sexual violence. That was sort of the the only required entry question to finish the survey. And then we tried to make the how many times has this happened question happen, but uh, with a low uh, psychological load. So we gave three options, once, two to four times, or five or more. Um, and as you can see here, over 90% of respondents were multiple survivors, uh, and half had been exposed to, to more than five incidents of sexual violence. We also asked as a, as a baseline, at what point in their life uh, people had been exposed to sexual violence, um, and for over half, it was both as a child and as an adult, uh, which is an indicator of, of this lifelong exposure to, to, to sexual violence. And we did find that uh, statistically, uh, people who were assigned female at birth, uh, regardless of their current gender identity, uh, did have uh, a higher likelihood of only being exposed to sexual violence as children uh, rather than across the lifespan. Um, so then what we did was ask about who they told after the violence took place. Uh, almost two thirds told their friends, uh, almost half told a mental health provider or a therapist, um, around a quarter told partner or family members, and less than 20% in both cases told either a healthcare provider that was not a mental health provider or a police officer. Um, and I think it's important to highlight both of those numbers that we have really low reporting to the more formalized systems of sexual violence record keeping, medical providers and, and uh, police. Uh, there's, there's very, very low reporting. Um, we then asked uh, what happened when you went to try to seek help from these different types of people. And I'm gonna zoom in on, I think two, yep, two of these. Uh, the first of them is 
um, the healthcare providers. Uh, so we asked participants, uh, what happened when you told a doctor or a nurse or another health provider, uh, not including mental health providers, and we gave them a, a list uh, that they could select from. So these are, this is a, a multiple mark uh, quantitative question. Um, and 40% uh, felt unsafe telling the medical provider. 40% uh, felt that they were not given a choice in the gender of the person that examined them. Uh, only 43% said that they felt that they were believed by the medical practi pra practitioner, which means that over half felt that they were not believed when they went in to report this to a, to a medical practitioner. Um, only 40% were told that it was not their fault uh, and explicitly 17% were told that it was their fault because they were transgender diverse or non-binary, uh, which is a pretty harrowing statistic. And unfortunately it gets worse when you get to law enforcement. Uh, in the law enforcement context, uh, just to note, you've got about four minutes left. Just saying, you're timer. doing great on time. I've got a timer. Thanks very much. 65% uh, felt unsafe uh, due to being transgender, diverse, or non binary. Uh, only, uh, excuse me, 71% were not able to have a choice uh, in who examined them. Um, nearly a third, 29%, were harassed or assaulted by the police while they were reporting sexual violence. Um, only 18% were told they were, they were believed, which is a really significant difference from uh, the healthcare providers, uh, less than a quarter. And again, 18% were told that it was not their fault. And nearly half, 47%, were explicitly told that it was their fault that they were exposed to sexual violence because they were trans, gender diverse, or non binary. So, really disturbing uh, statistic in that respect. Um, we followed up uh, this set of reflexive questions. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't think I made it super clear. In both of these cases, this slide and the last one, only people who had marked that they went to the police received these questions. So these statistics, these percentages are out of the people who went. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty small number of people that are responding to this question on the slide right now. Only about 25 people uh, responded to this. And so these percentages are based on a, on a denominator of 25. Um, we also then asked an open-ended question about what would have made it easier. Uh, and there are three main issues there. Uh, they are education of providers and people that they were seeking help from, um, increasing the ease of access to, uh, to care and to help, um, and information on where to go and who would be supportive. Um, I, I want to zoom in again, again a bit on education. And, and there were clear sub-themes about education directed at providers uh, and at other professionals involved in, in uh, help seeking. Um, and the first of them is just basic information about gender identity. Our respondents repeatedly mentioned that they didn't understand what gender identity was when they went to seek help. Uh, so it was that was a ma massive barrier. Um, additionally, about trauma and multiple trauma. And then we saw many specific mentions of the relationship between trauma and transgender diverse and non-binary people. Uh, and so that there was a clear need uh, to have trans-specific trauma-informed training for providers uh, across uh, the, the different um, help-giving uh, arenas when it comes to sexual violence. Um, to, uh, to, to comment just, just a bit on, on information on, on whom to go to and who would be supportive, uh, one of the things that we found in the, in the survey uh, and, and really was part of the, the crux of why we started the organization in the first place is that most of the trans respondents to our survey, as well as most of the, the, the survivors that we know generally, as well as those of us involved in the organization, felt that existing programs weren't accessible for us. Uh, and didn't know if there were accessible programs or weren't sure that they would really be accessible. Uh, so there's a really significant need just to document what providers are available and who would be both trans and trauma informed and able to speak to the specific issues that trans people exposed to sexual violence experience. Uh, just to wrap up, um, we are uh, sort of continuing with data collection type of work. Um, we do some collaboration with, uh, with researchers in academia working on sexual violence, uh, particularly when those are cis researchers so that they have uh, some accountability to, to trans survivors and, and organizations working specifically with trans survivors. Um, 
And we also have uh, a desire to do some specific uh, legal analyses uh, as part of our, our ongoing research work. Um, I'd like to thank the other uh, other actors in Trans Survivors Network, the members of the advisory board, our interpreters, the respondents, and all of the consultants on the project. My email's there, and I'll put the slides on the Hoover platform uh, later this evening. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you, Keenan, for a really fantastic presentation and for really fantastic work uh, on an under researched topic. Um, I know I and a lot of folks appreciate it. Uh, so now we will turn it over to Candy to start whenever you're ready. And Candy has said that she's comfortable with social media as well for those who are tweeting and such. Pues muchísimas gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Candace. Thank you very much. I am Candace Chavez. I am an activist in favor of trans women. I've been so for about six years in Mexico. I currently live in London. So, in a way, I should talk to you about legal recognition of the identities in Latin America and about violence. I work with the Latin American and Caribbean network of trans people, Red Lat Trans. I, I also work there from my Mexican space for the Mexican region on uh, cases of violence and rights violations against trans women. We need to recognize that. Even if we have an identity law that recognizes our identifying name and our gender is very important but it's just the first step. It's just the very beginning to really uh, have our rights recognized. We are one of the most vulnerable populations and attacked populations in history. As women, we are one of the most neglected populations. This is part of the historical de debt that governments, states and societies have with us as trans women. It is mandatory for us to recognize and know that violence against us also has nuances that have to do with misogyny, the lack of empathy, and especially the lack of recognition towards gender as such and its diversities. We're so focused on genitals when we, we think about gender, we, we have these sexual and biological ideas, so we forget that sex or gender depends on the person and that it's defined by other characteristics that have nothing to do with our physical anatomy or with our chromosomal identity, etc. Mexico is the second most violent country in the world uh, right after Brazil for trans people, uh, more specifically trans women. Around a month ago, we had a wave of murders. Eight trans women were murdered. They were murdered in the country in just under a month. So it's a, an alarming figure that should really uh, worry us. The Mexican state, as many Latin American states, uh, is not recognizing or penalizing this, uh, criminalizing this type of crime that are associated with hate and transphobia we should in a way begin to include all the people, everyone, and we should also acknowledge everyone, everyone's needs. The Mexican state re has recognized the identity law. I participated in, Jalis in the Jalisco process, that's my state, and its law process as well, and also in Ajari. I was part of the Mexican Trans Women Network. I was a secretary general. And uh, I also, from there, I started working at the uh, Red Trans, Red La Trans. And we worked towards uh, getting these laws passed. Actually, Jalisco, my state, was the first state to uh, recognize trans childhoods and, and, and children were allowed to change their names as well. 
So we have made progress, our legal identity has been recognized, but we still lack the basic right to work in order to have decent housing, the right medical care, uh, the, in order to have the uh, right education and social development as other people do. We are very much an attacked popula population and we are neglected. We are left behind. And we must remember that trans women have very specific health needs uh, regarding hormonal treatments, um, surgeries as well. Because I remember I had to document several problems uh, that my uh, friends have. For instance, the last of the lack of right, uh, the right access to health, because we are lacking health professionals that are really trained or sensitive enough um, to uh, to help trans people. So actually, healthcare can be rude or shocking to us, and many of us just uh, don't go to the doctors anymore. Uh, and these are. Uh, adds to the lack of knowledge, the lack of empathy when it comes to explaining uh, body construction issues. For instance, uh, there are silicone imp implants that are bad quality, that are, that are also sketchy surgeries uh, going on, etc. We need education and we need to educate the rest of the population on these topics, which are essential for us. It has happened to me on many, many occasions that some colleagues have health issues uh, that have to do with themselves or maybe caused by the lack of uh, really knowing how to treat our bodies correctly. Unfortunately for us trans women is the tool it's not something we have conquered, it's something that we have inherited for quite a long time. We have inherited uh, sex work as our only work. Therefore, we build our bodies for consumption and we should stop uh, building bodies to be consumed. We should build bodies to fulfill our own satisfaction and meet our own expectations within the transition we're going through. Although it is true that almost 85, 90% of the cases that I had to document were trans femicides. There were women, uh, women were murdered all the time. These were trans women uh, who were attacked and they had these, uh, there was this hate element in the femicides. Many of them were stabbed after, ha after having been uh, tied uh, down, for instance, they would remove their genitals uh, or, or, or their implants as well. These are very violent situations that are experienced in Latin America until now. We are still being harassed and murdered. Life expectancy of a trans woman in Latin America is 35 to 40 years old. Our life, life expectancy is not high. And it is really worrying. It's half of our lives, half the life a cis person might have. We only have half of those years, half of the opportunities as well to live a full life. Many of us have to leave our home countries because of that, of that violence, looking for new opportunities and looking for new new horizons, building new expectations as we cannot have this in our own home countries. We cannot develop and live a full life. We're still being stigmatized in just only one employment option because there are no other real employment opportunities. Discrimination and violence are, are the way people show our, our identity and they underestimate our value and therefore many of us have to rethink where we are and what we want as an activist i i feel i i i think of myself as a social fighter and i try to lead the way or or or, or build new paths not really for me and 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 my 
my colleagues, but for the future generations and of course to gain the respect of society. I don't think that you might agree or not with my existence. I think that what people should agree with is in the way that I decide to live my life. The only way that we will be able to eradicate the violence that we suffer in Latin America as if we are able to build spaces and when we begin educating people in trans issues, that is so urgent. We should stop pathologizing ourselves. We should stop thinking about specific requirements for whatever processes or paperwork that is needed. We should be acknowledged by our own identity, who we acknowledge to be. I think that the Red Lat Trans website, on this website, you can look at the 2018, 2019 reports. She's breaking up quite a bit, if you can let her know. How we live, this was a hi, very rich hi, sorry. process. I just, I just want to interject here, Candence. Apparently, your your connection is breaking up a bit, so we're losing some of your stuff. Can you hear me? Apparently, you're you're breaking up a bit, so we're losing some of your presentation. Okay. No. Uh, yeah, you're coming in and out. And you also have five minutes left. Five I was and a five minute. Warning. I was saying, so you can access the reports at the Red Lat Trans platform, reports from 12 countries, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia, Belize. So there are several country reports where we documented transphobia cases and the level of violence that we still suffer, how trans women are still the main victims of violence. It is so urgent, although I don't live in Mexico anymore, it is so important to continue not only empowering myself, but empowering our, my sisters. Even by living in Europe, I am still in close contact with all of my activist colleagues. I am always working in Mexico. I always want to work for the inclusion of trans women and to promote their rights. So this is a little bit of what activism looks like in Mexico, what violence looks like in Latin America and how we document it. I had firsthand experience with violence my country is very violent. It has been very violent to me for being who I am. And when you resist, you exist. And I think trans women, we are a big part of the revolution within the broader revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And then giving interpreters a chance to catch up. Um, our final presentation for this panel is coming from uh, Kai Davison. Uh, and they're going to be presenting on exploring non-binary individuals' experiences with incarceration, and they've let me know that they're comfortable with their work and the presentation being shared on social media. So take it away whenever you're ready, and thanks. Um, can you also allow me to share my videos since I'm also presenting? 
yeah, my co-presenter um, is also here. Uh, try that now. Thank you. Cool, Finn is going to share their screen and we'll get started. Can everyone see our presentation? I, I, yeah, okay, I think it's good. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to our presentation. Thank you so much for being here. We will be presenting on non-binary inv individuals experiences with incarceration in the United States. Uh, we do want to like to make it clear that this is the way that it is in the United States. This is not necessarily the way it is internationally. We are presenting from an, a United States perspective. So I'm Kai, I'm on the left. Um, I use they, them pronouns, EA and Espanol. Um, and I am a fourth year undergraduate student at Lehigh University studying psychology and music. Um, I'm white, queer, non-binary, mentally ill, small fat, a US citizen and a plant parent. Um, an image description really fast, I am a white person with green and brown hair wearing blue headphones and a blue plaid shirt with some brightly colored things in my background. Hi, and I'm Finn. Um, I'm a master's in counseling students. My student, <laughs> my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm at Lehigh University. I'm a 35 year old white, queer, genderqueer, Jewish-ish, Quaker-ish, sometimes able-bodied, U.S. citizen who is a mega nerd, small fat, has somewhat invisible disabilities with a service dog. Um, I'm also an artist, fat activist, and plant parent. Uh, the image description is um, there's a red background with some plants and I have a shaved head. I'm a white person with pretty much black hair and a floral button down shirt on. <laughs> um, this is actually a collaboration. Uh, we're on a team of researchers. Um, so there's also some pictures of our other team members on this project. Um, so we have Maddie and Sine and Nick here. And they are all also at Lehigh University. Uh, we also wanna provide a brief content warning. We'll be mentioning incarceration, violence, and poor outcomes for transgender and non-binary individuals. We will not be going into depth and there are not um, detailed descriptions or images, but please be aware of your limits. You are welcome to leave the presentation at any time to take care of yourself without us noticing or taking it personally. Um, these are challenging topics and self-care is very important. We also want to make a land acknowledgement uh, we wrote this presentation on unceded land that was stolen from the Lenni Lenape. They were stewards of this land for thousands of years before the arrival of colonizers and it experienced and continue to experience genocide, oppression, and silencing. Decolonization must be an active and ongoing process of reconciliation. We also want to further honor the indigenous queer and two-spirit voices, acknowledged and unacknowledged, recorded and unrecorded, that have spoken out and fought for us all under their layers of oppression. We honor their amazing resistance, resilience, and strength, and express deep gratitude and support for their ongoing work. Let us collectively fight for the rights of all of our indigenous family. We encourage everyone in this room to support indigenous communities with your resources, institutional or social power, and in your professional and personal circles. Just a quick agenda. Um, we're gonna do an intro um, and then the current literature, the limited current literature, um, an overview of our in progress research, um, some suggestions and recommendations, and finally a call to action. So some background, as we know, gender is not a binary and is also not the same as sex. However, unfortunately, presence in the United States often conflate them all. Although the policies vary from state to state in the United States and are in flux due to 2018 changes in the Transgender Offender Manual, which conflict with the Prison Rape Elimination Act, individuals are often placed according to genitalia or sex assigned at birth, which often leads to violence, harassment, and rape, not to mention the various negative psychological outcomes associated with being misgendered. 
Additionally, the police and the prison system disproportionately criminalize Black, indige Indigenous, and Latina individuals. So it is important that we frame this discussion with a distinctly intersectional lens. So for the current literature, there is very little academic literature on the subject, and there's hardly even any discourse in non-academic circles um, on specifically the experiences of incarcerated NBGQ individuals. Um, in a 2020 article by Jessica Szyminski, there is a brief account of the experience of one gender non-conforming individual, which supports our beliefs about the negative experiences of non-binary and gender non-conforming individuals in binary prison systems. However, this is only one of the instances we found um, that discuss the specific experiences of non-binary individuals, which is not not being placed sort of under the transgender or LGBTQ umbrella. Um, since there is virtually no literature dedicated to solely to incarcerated non-binary individuals, we will discuss some of the overall information about the prison system as it relates to the wider transgender community. Um, given that TGNC individuals are overrepresented in the criminal justice system with 16% of TGNC adults having spent time in jail or prison compared with 5% of all adults in the US, it is imperative to gather more information and advocate for all of these populations. To be abundantly clear, this is not because TGNC adults are involved in more crime, uh, but due to its systemic in inequities and discrimination. Moreover, the 2011 and 2012 National Inmate Survey researchers found incarcerated transgender people reported experiencing 12 times the amount of sexual assault as in all incarcerated adults. Um, also, we'll have references at the end and our presentation is attached to um, our Whova thing. Uh, so you all can look at these resources if you want. Um, additionally, these surveys did not break down these numbers by other intersecting factors such as race, race ethnicity, and religion. Given these in, the intersecting systemic injustices, we would assume that these numbers would be even higher if those intersecting identities would be taken into account. For example, Reiser and colleagues found that trans women of color are more likely to experience incarceration than women and non-Hispanic trans women. Furthermore, the authors report that trans women of color were more likely to be victimized during their incarceration period. Following that, in a study of 1,200 LGBTQ prisoners by Black and Pink, 78% of trans, non-binary, and two-spirit respondents experienced emotional pain from hiding their gender. In addition, only 21% of respondents were allowed access to underwear and cosmetics that match their gender. And imagine how much more complex this is with non-binary and gender queer people who do not match the binary. Furthermore, research shows that trans and gender variant individuals often do not receive adequate mental, medical care in the penitentiary system, including transition care and otherwise. So now our research, um, we will briefly discuss our research and um, we were hoping to have data to present, uh, but we've actually been very careful and mindful of the design of our research because this is such an important and also sensitive topic. Um, we have received IRB approval and are in the process of recruiting participants. Our research group is conducting semi-structured interviews of formerly incarcerated non-binary and genderqueer individuals. This study aims to draw attention to and amplify the voices of this marginalized community and inspire change impacting the incarceration experience of, of non-binary and genderqueer individuals in the future. Based on the lack of research, we are not making any specific hypotheses, but rather operating from an open phenomenological approach to understand the experiences with incarceration. Amplifying these voices is the central goal of, of our research. Participating participants are being recruited through um, 2S LGBTQIA plus spaces and in community centers using snowball sampling and interviews conducted through Zoom. If you are or know anyone who might fit our criteria, we would be deeply grateful for their your or their participation. Um, the recruitment flyer is actually attached to our session page if you would like to share it. 
So I will talk about some suggestions that we have uh, regarding research that uh, you may want to do um, and should be done in the future, starting with reviewing the existing literature on non-binary and genderqueer and trans experiences and incarceration. All of these are very important to understanding the experiences that we're talking about. Also including and following the lead of non-binary and genderqueer and or previously incarcerated individuals. These are their lived experiences and therefore should be followed and included. It's very important. Um, additionally, engage in advocacy and activism efforts in general and specifically supporting these groups and engage in and forward the conversation on prison abolition. And I just want to emphasize that this is not only our research, but it's also a call to action for everyone. Um, this isn't even being talked about, let alone having anything done about it, at least where we are. Um, if it is happening in your country, that would be would love to hear about it. Um, so we can continue to increase disparities for individuals with minoritized gender identities, or we can begin to create a foundation of literature and use our power and our influence in our circles and communities to do better. I wanna emphasize that everyone can make change just wherever they already are. Um, the prison industrial complex is built in a way that further marginalizes individuals who are already marginalized, such as NBGQ individuals. It is critical to bring awarenesses to these experiences in the prison system in order to combat the erasure of their experiences and identities. And these are the references. Our slides are available attached to our session um, and feel free to reach out to us for more information. Uh, we also have our recruitment flyer in attached to our session and we are happy to answer any questions you may have in the upcoming Q&A. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you both for such a great presentation. Um, I wanted to make one quick announcement. Um, and I believe one of our tech volunteers and a couple others had this link handy uh, just before we go into the Q&A session. Uh, one of the co-organizers of the conference uh, had a recent loss uh, in, in their community in France. And unfortunately, they're having to organize a separate sort of ceremony and remembrance opportunity for her community, uh, for her to be remembered with respect and the way that her trans community knew her. So we're gonna share the link in the chat for a fundraiser and those funds will go toward being able to bring her chosen family and friends together to celebrate her life and her memory. Um, and I'm sure it's a really deeply triggering topic when we lose someone in our communities. Um, and I'm sure we all have an experience like that. So hopefully if you're able, you can share the link or even contribute to the fundraising effort yourself so that uh, we can honor one of our siblings lives from afar even. Um, and thank you again to uh, Anthony and Lee, to Keenan, to Candy, and to Kai and Claire, or Kai and Finn, apologize for your presentations. Um, and I'm going to take a quick survey of the questions that we've amassed, both on the platform, and I see already that a couple of y'all have been answering them typed out. So if you did ask a question as an attendee, um, then you may want to open that Q&A function again and check the answered tab just to make sure yours hasn't already been answered. Um, and yeah, it looks like we have a couple that are going to be notes specifically to Candy um, as references for other things, including uh, Mariposas Sin Fronteras, um, and other LGBTQI migrant organizations. Go ahead. Oh, can, uh, I, I thought you wanted to respond to that candy. Uh, we had two of those. Yeah. 
I just wanted to. Candy is breaking up. Um, I can't hear her. Uh, no encuentro la pregunta. Me la podría decir cuál fue para poder. Ah, uh, sure. Um, I'll read that second question aloud in English, yeah. and then our yeah. interpreter can translate yeah. it to Spanish for you. Uh, they're asking, do you work with Mariposa yeah. Sin Fronteras or other LGBTQI yeah. migrant organizations? No. Yo, eh, so, so, so. Sí, eh, realmente en México nosotros nos hacemos de la parte. Yes. Sorry, the, the audio is not good enough. There are several referent institutions for migrant women and they work directly with the, with the red, with the LAC trans network. Sorry about that. That's totally okay. Uh, thank you for your answer, Candy. And I think we're also having a little bit of audio issues being able to hear you. Sometimes it's coming through clear and then other times it's a little jumbled, but I think we got a good part of what you were able to share as an answer. So thank you. Gracias. And I've got um, a question from Zachary Derek that is directed to Canon, I believe, but I'm but I'm going to direct it to Canon and then I will pose it to the rest of the panelists as well because I think it, it may be relevant. Um, and Zachary asks, how does the Trans Survivors Network intend to use the data collected to benefit the community? Um, and I think we could pose that question more generally to other panelists as well. Yeah. If Thanks very much for the question. Um, <clears throat> our advocacy is further in our expertise than academia. None of us are academics. Uh, we're all sort of on the more policy advocacy side uh, or in direct grassroots support advocacy. So our intention with the next phase of this work is to create a set of um, one pagers or flyers in each of the languages we're working in. Uh, that can be used for local advocacy. Um, it is our belief that uh, specific sort of survivor as individual oriented work is best done at the, at the local level. And so our, we're not positioned well to work with local service providers, but rather to try to collect the kind of information that activists in cities and, and countries need to be able to, to work with those providers. Um, so that, that's kind of where we've positioned our, our work. Um, so as I said, we're creating a series of, um, of briefing notes. We're trying to bring this information to conferences like this, but to, to other spaces as well. We presented at WPATH last year. We'll present a similar uh, talk at EPATH in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and just trying to raise awareness. And then our intention with some of the next phases, as I mentioned earlier, is to do some legal analysis uh, and, and try to integrate that then into sort of what people's experiences look like versus uh, what the law says they should be like and use that to create advocacy uh, documents and guidance uh, for, for activists working at the, at the local level. Um, but sort of regional or international advocacy work on, on this issue uh, is it's not especially well placed. Um, however, one of the pieces we are doing at the regional and international level is trying to raise funders and donors attention to the problem uh, because that, that can be done at a, at a more sort of generalizable level. Um, and so we're, we're engaging in that space a bit as well, just to try to bring some of the data to their attention so that they look for organizations at the local level working on this topic to support. Thank you. 
Uh, we still have about four minutes left. So if Sen and Kai or Anthony and Lee would like to answer that question about data as well, or if you have something to add, Candy, that'd be great. I can I can answer for us. Um, Kai actually originally um, envisioned this project as a, an exhibition um, and to really get people's voices directly into the public. Um, and I think we definitely still have that intention. Um, and we actually submitted a commentary that was not accepted for publication that was just like, hey, this is an issue, like, please, like, and they were like, once you have data, we'll publish it. So that's kind of where we are in this process of like, this is kind of how it works and people need things to point to, to be like, hey, this is a problem. Um, so kind of what was just being talked about of like, this is information that can be used by activists in order to shed light on the whole situation. Amazing. I love that concept of a public exhibition as well to make sure that people get to interact more directly with with what people with that lived experience are talking about. Um, we still got about maybe two minutes left before I need to close the room uh, to set up for our very last panel. Um, so if anybody has some quick final thoughts they'd like to share, feel free to, to chime in before we have to end. Creo que en, en el aspecto general lo que quería comentar. I think that uh, I wanted to say something more general. Every time we need to be together, all of us together, so that we can work from a global perspective uh, to protect our rights. There has been some progress, but also some regression. So we need to make sure that we need to share uh, our support, also our experience from our own regions. So, from our, so every piece of information can be useful to others so that we can uh, create together a global network that will make us visible and will uh, uh, stop people from murdering us. Thank you very much. I agree 100%. And I know uh, all of our volunteers, co-organizers, I'm sure our panelists and attendees agree as well that we're trying to, with conferences and spaces like this, be able to build power together as opposed to relying on the expectation that we need to take power from existing institutions. That instead we can try to do things like this and make power for ourselves. So I really appreciate that, that powerful call to action, Candy. Um, and with that, I think we're out of time. So I'm gonna need to close the room down. Please do, if you didn't already, before we lose it, when the chat closes, take a look at that link. Um, that we shared for the fundraiser for Amelia. Uh, it would mean the world to the co-organizers uh, and to her community. Um, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Uh, merci bien a tous et toutes. Et muchísimas gracias a todos. Uh, and we'll see you for the final panel uh, in just a moment. Thanks again.